Shirley Adams for the Sewing Connection Series 15, Program 12. The silk bloomers to which I'm referring have nothing to do with lingerie. These garments are way on the outside, usually jackets or coats, but possibly dresses. Fabric layers are stacked and stitched and then slashed so that they open up and bloom. Hardly a new idea. The history of slashed garments goes way back several centuries. Actually, it goes back to the 15th century as the earliest record of it in costume history in the books. And this is when Swiss soldiers returned from battle, and they were most victorious in that battle. But this is back in the day of sword fights and rapiers and whatever else, the knife-like things they might have used. But they uh, ended up after the battle with a lot of slashes in their sleeves and wherever else. And so as they were going home, they would stuff things in them. They were a little cold. They would stuff maybe pieces of banner or pieces of their tent or whatever. And as they were welcomed home, all victorious, uh, this fashion spread all over Europe. And for about the next century, there were all sorts of slashed clothes all over. It might have been from pants to tops to whatever. Everything was slashed, and you'd see other fabrics coming out. So that's the idea. Now, that's several centuries ago, and it still is appearing. Well, I'd like to show you a couple of kind of different techniques with these slashed garments and uh, at different times when they might be slashed. So first of all, let's look at some models in them. And these three, all of them, were made by Beverly Ralph of Leavenworth, Kansas. And the techniques are kind of similar in that, first of all, the fabric was slashed. Uh, that means they can be cut with a rotary cutter. And uh, the fabric was slashed, and then it was put on the fabric afterwards. Notice in the uh, cinnamon one that uh, it has not only been slashed, but also it has, uh, some of them have been turned back a little bit and uh, they've been stitched down that way so that you see little kind of fan-like things on them. So that's interesting. The other one is a jungle print and these also you can see on the chest and a few other places it has been slashed and turned back and then stitched again so that it looks a little different. And notice, uh, think about these prints. I'm going to talk about those in a minute and show you on the table, but first of all, let's think about how those prints, if you slash them first, how do you put them back together again? And does it matter how you put them back? Well, just maybe it does. And then the dark one is uh, in blacks and blues and very pretty, and notice now down on the sleeve, she has little circles that you can see between the slashes, and that's pretty. And this is a little dressier one. She has a little glitz here and there. And so this is one technique, and I want to show you how that's done. Uh, first of all, almost all of these jackets that you'll see that are slashed will probably be made with a very, very simple design, a simple pattern, because this is appropriate. When you do so much to it, of course, you're going to start with a simple design. And this is true of so many of the wearable art type things I've been showing you, just to give you a little inspiration, to give you some ideas. Almost all of them are quite simple garments and then changed a little bit because of the uh, whatever's put on top. Well, here's how most of them start out. Instead of having a standard arm's eye with the sleeve, instead of that they probably have that removed and a cut on sleeve put on so that it is a lot easier. You won't have to worry about the sleeves and how it all comes together and the fact that they are separate. This just makes it all in one, the bodice and the sleeve. And uh, so this is going to be easier and this is what you saw with all those and what you will see with the rest of them. So once we have that pattern all in mind, then let's think about how we're going to do that slashing and what difference it would make. If I would do one out of these leaves, they're kind of randomly placed, and there are a lot of different colors on this dyed fabric. And then I'm going to put it on top of uh, another fabric and uh, on top of still another fabric. Now, I'm going to show you one first before I slash this to show you that you can use many fabrics or you can use just a few, however you want. This one's seven layers of it. And so once this would be washed and shaken out a little bit in the dryer, then uh, they'd open up a little bit and they would indeed bloom. But how many layers there depends on you. So here I'm just having three layers, but it could be any number you like. Okay, if we're going to slash these and if they are then going to ravel because there'll be raw edges, What's the best way to do it? On the bias, of course. And so uh, we can put this fabric on the straight, but because there are 
45 degree marks on the cutting board, then you can very nicely cut a perfect diagonal. So if I just put the fabric here so that it lines up with the lines on the straight, and if I then uh, put my uh, ruler here on the bias on that 45 degree angle, then we can very easily slash these lines. And if we do them, oh, maybe about uh, every what inch, maybe just about every inch is all I need. And uh, I'll just do a few. It doesn't even matter if they're all the same. In fact, they don't need to be the same. You can make them different if you want to. But I'll do these about every inch. And then what she has done is apply them to the base fabric. And then they're stitched on. But the important thing now is how are you going to apply them to that base fabric? And so, is it going to be like this? Am I, for instance, going to put this one here and put this one here right next to it so you see continuity? Or am I going to put it here and put something else in between so that it is a little broken up or maybe turn one around and put it the other direction? Uh, you can arrange this however you want. And it might be pretty if it's just put in some uh, unusual shape and not even the way it was originally cut. So the choice is yours, as usual. You are the designer, so you do whatever you please. So this one, it's all broken up. And after you break it up like this, you'd pin it down and then go ahead and do some stitching on it. Uh, you could, if you didn't want them all to show like this, uh, if you wanted more to show other colors, you could also cut some of these slightly smaller size so that, and you saw one of these on uh, those that you just saw, uh, there were some other colors showing at the sides because the top layer was cut a little bit narrower, so that's a possibility. Now let's look at another fabric here and see if this would make uh, the rules any more rigid than those original uh, ones. Now look at those fish. What would that look like if you'd break it all up? It isn't too likely that you would. This is like her jungle animals, where you would probably put them on right in order. And I'm doing something else here. I'm going to put it on a black background, but I have another uh, fabric in back of it. It's virtually the same colors, except for a black background and a white background here. Other than that, the colors are almost identical. And because of that, uh, when it fluffs up, when it opens up a little bit, it might be quite interesting to see what happens. So this one, you would just have to be sure when you get some of those slices, and I'm coming over here a little bit more this time, and I'm lining it up with lines on the ruler. There are so many lines there that it's going to be always easy to line it up so that you can get nice straight lines. Now, if you'd cut this on the straight, picture how it might look when you uh, put it through the washer and dryer. Probably not too terrific, because you'd have long, stringy ravelings, whereas this way it just sort of fluffs up on the edge and it wouldn't matter at all. Okay, once we have a few of these cut, then, then it is putting together a jigsaw puzzle when you put it on uh, the fabric. So they would have to be put right in order. We'd have to put this one down first, except we'd slash the rest of it. And then we would have to put this one down second. And I didn't push quite hard enough here. OK, this would have to be down second. And of course, you move it up or down, whatever works, until it matches completely. And uh, so on, as you do all of them. And then when you get them all lined up, and all of them uh, just in order, then you could go ahead and put a few pins in it to hold them there. Whoops, let's pull these all down this way a little bit more and uh, put a few pins in to hold it before you take it over to the sewing machine. And then go ahead and do these uh, lines. Now, you can see how that would be stitched then right down the center. And I probably won't do that right now. We may get to it later. But do put some pins in that, or you're going to lose it. And uh, you'd have to adjust maybe a little bit. If I'd put pins in this, by the way, I'd put them sideways, since I'm going to be stitching this way or maybe it doesn't matter since you'd need to pull them out anyway before you got to it. But the point is, do put a few pins in it or you'll lose it. Anyway, once that's done, see how that would make a difference. So think about it and try it different ways depending on what fabric you use to see how you would actually uh, find it most appealing to you. Well, let's look at a few other ones because uh, there's another way to do this besides applying it like this. OK, what we have here is one by Kathleen Denario from Midvale, Utah. And isn't this pretty? Now, you always thought that, oh, if you do anything sideways, it's going to make you look broader. This uh, is very, very slim. 
And if the model will hold an arm out, you can see that those lines actually are all stitched sideways. They kind of wave back and forth. They aren't straight lines as we usually do. They're wavy lines going from one wrist to the other. And then you just slash right down the center between the lines. And she has noticed a little bit of glitz there. She has a little sequin sewn in here and there frequently throughout the uh, jacket. This one's dressier. It's uh, amazingly lightweight, but it doesn't add bulk because the lines are close enough together that it doesn't all puff out a lot and add a lot of bulk. Now, the wider apart you stitch and the more you wash and dry it and the more layers you have, the more it's going to fluff out and really bloom. So if you don't want it to get any bigger, then you would put your stitching lines closer together and keep it closer to your body that way so that it would be uh, narrower and not add any bulk at all. Now, also what was different is the first ones you saw were all cottons. And so they were probably more casual. These are a little more dressy. They're in rayons. They could be in silks. They could be in whatever fabric you like. But they are a little dressier because of the fabric usually is what makes the difference. Here's another one. And this was done by uh, Nanette Holmberg. And she's from Salt Lake City, Utah. And this black and white one, notice that this one she did in the diagonal direction. So all this was cut on the straight uh, originally. And then the sewing and the slashing was done on the diagonal. And notice how she really has a bat wing sleeve there that uh, the sleeve isn't very long at all because from under the arm, from the hip on up to the wrist, it really is a very gentle slope. And uh, then she has several layers there. You wouldn't believe how heavy this is. It is rayon and it is quite weighty and yet it isn't bulky because these rows were close enough together that they didn't cause any bulk at all. Notice also on her other one here, this is also Nanette's and it is in multicolors and uh, she has a little nautical look there with the stars and the um, braid around it and she also has a pretty lining in it that looks nautical with all the flags and banners. Now that's appropriate if she also realized that the origin was they were stuffing banners in, in those slashes. Uh, maybe this was just a coincidence. Uh, but notice how those lines all look wavy. You can see them on this multicolor one better than you could on the black and white. And notice how the lines are all wavy. Well, when I saw this at first, I thought, oh, she cut it with a wave blade. And uh, upon closer examination, no, she didn't. She cut it with a straight blade. But because uh, of the rayon and the way it opened and bloomed a little bit, it looks like it's wavy. So a very interesting uh, effect there also. Now, if you wanted to do that first one and cut it with a wave blade, there are certainly those. Now, I just used this edge as a straight edge on the other side of it before. But this platform is just marvelous. This platform cutter is just terrific for when you do actually want to cut a wave. And if this is of the sea, the fish, I'll just go ahead and cut this with a wave blade to show you that this might be a nice variation. Uh, what this cutter does is you just push on this and the blade goes down and as soon as you release it, it comes back up where it's safe so you won't get cut. But this one does a beautiful job of just cutting a wave. And then we'll cut a second wave by putting it down here and just see what that looks like. So this is also a way you could do it. And uh, then when you stitch down the center and open it up or uh, put it on your garment and wash it, then it definitely would have a little wave to it because you've actually cut waves in it. So a lot of variations. Uh, anyway, let's go on to the second uh, group that was done. And those you do not cut with the rotary because they have to be cut after they're stitched. So this is the idea with those, and this is usually the way you see it stitched. Now here I have all of these many, many layers, and after you have all of these uh, to start out with, just draw one line. And I would probably just take a ruler like this and put it on the diagonal, use the 45 degree marker on it so that you can get it on an exact diagonal. And here we have the 45 degree line with the straight edge of the fabric. So I'll just move it up here where I can get a V right in the center of the fabric. And you just trace one line with a marker, a disappearing marker of some sort or maybe chalk, whatever. Make one line and thereafter then, you don't have to make any more lines, of course. You just use the quilting gauge that attaches to your machine and you can make all the other lines parallel. 
So you do all that stitching in here. If it's dressier or if you want a little glitz, use the metallic threads. Use whatever threads or cords you want to because you might also use that as a decorative part of it, the stitching, rather than have the stitching blend in completely. That's a possibility. And then after you're all finished with that, that's when you cut it. And uh, this is going to be real easy to start cutting because I've uh, staggered these edges. And what you cut it with depends. If those rows are far enough apart, you might use big shears. And think what shears you use in case you have any hand problems. And that's especially true when you get down to little scissors. Uh, if your hands are at all, um, find it difficult to handle these little ones, remember there are alternatives. Here's a really nice soft cutter where you squeeze it slightly, but padded handle so it isn't much of a squeeze, and then the spring opens it up for you. So this might be the easiest tool for you to use. You decide which is easier for you. These rows are far enough apart, I'll just use some big shears to cut. And so I'm cutting right in between, right down the middle, and I'm cutting all these top layers. Do not cut all the way through, or you have nothing. It isn't all, it isn't put together. So I'm leaving the bottom layers. And in this case, I have two layers on the bottom because the back side of this print didn't really show up very well. And so if this is going to look nice on the inside, then I want that uh, good side to show both places. That's why there are two layers with the wrong sides facing each other so that it works out that way. But this is just a simple matter to cut all these slashes and it uh, doesn't take very long to just cut the whole thing, slash it all, put it through the washer and dryer if it's that kind of fabric that will go through and it fluffs out a little bit. If not, if it's going to be something silky, then you just shake it if you don't want to put it in the dryer. But even with silk, I would probably put it in the dryer with a damp towel and that would uh, give it just enough dampness to fluff it out a little bit. Now there are some other things that you might do that are silky. I saw a lot of these in wearable art shops, or I do, I travel really a lot and I see so many of them. I always like to check out those one-of-a-kind, wonderful shops. And I see these uh, silk uh, slash jackets running in the oh, 0800 to thousand dollar bracket, right about in that neighborhood. And that's a pretty nice neighborhood. So you might think about doing something that really is quite valuable. Uh, here are some other ideas with that. Now on this one, I decided to do it in silks and uh, yet I wanted to have a print inside so that when it does fluff up, you can see some other colors there. And I also thought, wouldn't it be fun if we'd have a reversible jacket here? There's no reason why it couldn't be. So I've done three layers here, and this is a deep color on this side to match the deep color of the print. And on the other side, I have a pastel color, and it's also the wrong side of the print, so it comes out about the same. It comes out pastel here, too. So this is the way you can have two jackets in one, have a reversible, and use three layers of fabric. I kind of like that idea. In fact, I saw a lot of them like this in various places around the country. And so if I would be doing this, I might want to think of some other fabrics that could be useful. For instance, this one I like. Uh, it has uh, three layers also, and this is really lightweight chiffon. So with these stripes, and they are probably about, oh, three quarters of an inch apart, that means that from the stitching line out to the slash, it's about three-eighths. So this isn't going to be a big fluffy garment. It's going to stay in close to the body because these are rather close together. But I like the idea that this is not only lavender on this side, but what shows through is kind of an olive green. And what shows on the other side is this darker green, kind of a blue green. So this would also be an idea that would give you more variety. And maybe you could wear this with several uh, different skirts or pants or dresses or whatever you'd put under this jacket or vest, whatever it is you make. Then I have this big piece of silk. And I've been thinking, I've been trying to make this up for a couple of years. And every time I look at it, I thought, wow, is that ever bright? I just might make it up into a slashed garment and use that under some other layers. Use that for the inside. And that might be a really good way to use it because it won't be destroying a good piece of silk and yet it might be toning it down a little bit if I feel more comfortable that way. What I'm trying to do this series is show you a whole range of things so that there's something for everybody, whatever your preferences are, and also whatever your capabilities are. So some things are pretty wild for you, other things are toned down, you think, yes, that's me, or the reverse, perhaps. Here's another one that I thought, wouldn't this be a fun thing? And what I have here is, again, a reversible. One color is going to be this fuchsia, the other side is going to be purple. In the middle of it, I have uh, 
a different shade of kind of uh, magenta. But what I have also is a few stripes in between. We're getting complicated. You know, I always sort of start out at the simplest, and then uh, my brain keeps uh, spinning around, and I get a little more and more complicated because you think of other variations. So I thought, now, wouldn't that be fun if we would just put some stripes? And I'll open this up so you can see the stripes. And if you're doing this, make those stripes long enough that you can see where they are on the outside because once they're covered up with fabric, then how do you know where they are and what direction to go and so on. So make sure you get these stripes long enough so you can see both ends of them here. Therefore, I know if I have the stripe going here, then I need to stitch the opposite direction so that when it all opens up, you can see different colors at times where that stripe shows through at some places, but not every place. Here, if I open it up, you can see what the stripes look like. They are simply laid on top. And some of them might not come all the way. If you have some little short pieces you want to use, that's all right, too. They just discontinue somewhere. But do lay all the stripes the same way. And all of these are bias cut. You can see by the way they stretch when I pull them. And I am putting them on the diagonal because this way, with all the bias cuts, nothing is going to ravel and look ugly. You know, it isn't going to shred. It's just going to fan out a little bit. So they're all put one way, the stitching goes the other way. And just as I have them this way on this side, at the same time, I want to add some colors to the other side. So if that's the case, then I have to have the first side sticking out there so I know which direction those go so I don't get completely confused. And then when I put these in, then I can just remove that pin, put this stripe in, and put a pin on top. Anyway, work out your system. But you can see, it could be kind of interesting that way. It could get kind of intriguing. Uh, you might also put some glitz in that by putting some stripes, even if it isn't on the outside. You might put some stripes of uh, lame in there and see what that does for it. Or I might mingle a few hand-dyed fabrics with some of this lightweight chiffon and uh, get a whole pretty watery look going here. So uh, another thing I thought would be kind of fun is a friend gave me this huge pareo. It's uh, about 45 inches wide and two yards long. Now, uh, if you don't find that you have a lot of use for it one way, or if you have something like this and you've worn it a long time and it's time to go, think about doing this in a slashed garment. This would also be pretty. There's already a little glitzy thread in it. And as I look at it, it has kind of stripes going. Um, that are woven right into the fabric. See those silver stripes going? And it has a combination of uh, jungle looks in it. There are zebras and leopards and whatever else. So we have stripes this way, and you could just do it one way. Or you could also fold one layer, cut it in half, and put one layer of it the other direction. And the effect that it's going to give is that of a plaid. You can kind of see the stripes coming through, as well as these new stripes. And then you might put that over something else completely, like uh, another flowered, maybe this one or maybe that one, and see what effect that makes if you put just one layer over the various flowers. Anyway, think it through and see what you can do with it. Let's go over to the machine. Let's just uh, take this over to the machine with us and see how you could do some of those fold backs and also how you could do something else that we saw on one of the jackets. What that is is little circles. And what I have here is a circle, just all stitched around the edge, and then cut it in half. Turn it right side out, and once it's turned and you press the edges, we've got these little finished circles. One of the jackets you saw had these inserted inside, and a couple of those look kind of pretty to be there in different areas. So you might put a few of those in to change the look of it. Whether you slash first or slash later, you could still do that. Or another one you saw had this done to it after it was stitched. See how the guard, uh, the quilting guide is just pushing this back automatically. So what I might do with this is a little bit of stitching across. And I want to do this, hopefully, so that it's uh, at right angles to the other. So here again, you might want to draw a line to make sure it is. But you saw this on one of the jackets. And before I come to it, I'll open it up. And so it might stitch across like this, all the way one way. And then maybe you'll come back the other way and have these open up back and forth. And that could be an interesting effect. Let me go back the other way just a little bit here so that you can see. And don't go too close, or it won't work uh, just as it should. You know, don't go real close. 
uh, but down here I might go back the other way and give it another little bit of interest. And again, with the quilt guide, you would, of course, just set it. There's a little screw here. Almost every brand of machine has this quilt guide with it. And with that little screw, you just move it out narrower or wider so that you can make uh, these rows just exactly how you want them. And uh, again, a little bit of variation. Or maybe with some of them, turn over just one layer of fabric. And with others, turn over all the layers of fabric. Or vary it however you want. Uh, this would be great on vests also. And more and more, I think we're all making vests because they're smaller, they're quicker garments, and uh, you can get the technique down, you can do something that's fun, and yet it doesn't take so much time as a larger garment would. So vests are almost like accessories, and yet they are actual garments. Well, those garments that we have seen, we've opened up. But sometimes a fabric is treated in exactly the opposite way. Maybe it's tied together while wonderful things happen. Join me next time for Shibori.